I'll say something about early Christian philosophy of history. Mainly, I'll talk about St. Augustine at this time. I'll discuss some other people. Now, um, is it anachronistic to talk about early Christian philosophy of history? Um, there's a reason for saying yes and a reason for saying no. The reason for saying yes is that St. Augustine, uh, St. Jerome, St. Gregory, do, and so on, do not uh, overtly describe themselves as engaging in philosophy of history. But uh, the reason for answering yes, they are doing philosophy of history, is that they're amongst the philosophical and theological enterprises that they're engaged in, we can discern something identical to what we would call philosophy of history. So I'm inclined to say that Augustine, Jerome, Gregory have uh, a philosophy of history or contribute to philosophy of history. Uh, in, in particular, I would say um, being one does not require knowing that you are one, or being one does not require describing yourself as one, or describing oneself as F is logically independent of being F. Now, we could also raise the question of whether there's any philosophy of history before uh, the church fathers. A reason for saying uh, no is that the remarks on history as a whole or historical explanation in Herodotus, Thucydides, Polybius, Livy and so on tend to be scattered through their historical writings. There's no single chapter or single book or homogeneous piece of writing that we could call philosophy of history before St. Augustine, really. Um, but the same sort of remark applies to the ancient Greeks and Greco-Romans and Romans. Here and there, they're engaged in trying to explain what history is, why anything happens at all in history. They're trying to decide whether history is cyclical or linear. In, in other words, they are engaged in something that we would call philosophy of history. So I, I just say these things to warn us of the danger of uh, retrospective anachronism. But we are really trying to do philosophy today. We're not trying to do uh, history. And as long as one's conscious of doing violence sometimes to what people write, it's all right to be anachronistic in philosophy. Now, say, I'll say something about St. Augustine. St. Augustine lived from 354 to 430 AD. And we can discern three major influences on his writing. Um, as a philosopher of history, my view of St. Augustine is going to be skewed or warped throughout for what we can learn about history from St. Augustine. Now, the first influence on St. Augustine is Manichaeism. Mani the second is Neoplatonism, and the third is the fall of the Roman Empire. Now, there's a huge historical debate that's gone on for centuries about when the fall of the Roman Empire was, but essentially, I'll take the Roman Empire to have fallen in 410 AD. Now, turning to Manichaeism first, the young Augustine, uh, subscribe to Manichaeism. Now, Manichaeism is a Middle Eastern uh, mystical cult which, in summary, has the following uh, tenets. Number one, there is a struggle between good and evil. Number two, 
there is a struggle between God and Satan. Number three, there is a struggle between spirit and matter. And matter is regarded as um, either evil or in some way a much lower, a much lower form of existence than uh, spirit. Now, these um, ideas derive from the teachings of uh, uh, Mani, M-A-N-I, who is a Persian 3rd century AD uh, mystic and uh, quasi-theologian. Now, in Manichaeism, these are three aspects of the same uh, struggle. There are not three separate struggles going on. But these are three facets or aspects of one cosmic struggle. Now, it's pretty clear that uh, Manichaeism is logically inconsistent with Christianity. Or um, by logically inconsistent here, I mean, if Manichaeism is true, Christianity is false. And if Christianity is true, then Manichaeism is false. Now, the main points of inconsistency with Christianity are, in much to my mind anyway, as follows. In Manichaeism, good and evil are equally uh, powerful. In particular, there's no ontological privileging of good over uh, evil. Secondly, evil exists as a positive uh, force in the world, and on most, uh, I suppose, on most um, influential Christian views, certainly on Augustine's view and Aquinas's view, uh, evil is to be understood as a privation of good. Well, that's not the uh, Manichaean uh, position. Uh, thirdly, and I suppose this is the same point in a different form, um, Satan and God are equally powerful in Manichaeism, and a, f- a further point of incompatibility with Christianity, in Manichaeism, it looks as though uh, creation is evil, and it looks as though creation is either a consequence of Satan's uh, behaviour or a consequence of the struggle between Satan and God. Now, all, clearly, all those uh, views have to be rejected if Christianity is uh, true. Now, now the young uh, Augustine is a Manichaeist, but he uh, gives it up in later in later life. Now, the second I, I mentioned Manichaeism because the shadow of Manichaeism is apparent in his developed Christian philosophy of history. Now, the second major influence on Augustine is Neoplatonism. Uh, now, it's pretty clear that Augustine read uh, Plotinus and probably uh, Porphyry. Uh, these are 3rd third, third century AD uh, writers. Um, Plotinus is a Greek-Egyptian writer who writes in, uh, in Greek, the author of the so-called Aeneas, but we can't go too far into that. I'll just mention the main tenets of Neo, Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism is a fusion of the following two things. Number one, the philosophy of Plato. And number two, uh, Middle Eastern mysticism. Middle Eastern mysticism, including some uh, Jewish and uh, Egyptian components. I think it's fair to say that the Neoplatonists don't think of themselves as uh, Neoplatonic mystics, even though we tend to, they just tend to think of themselves as Platonists. They they just think they've got the right understanding of Plato, or the most profound understanding of uh, Plato. Now, um, according to Neoplatonism, there's a distinction uh, between the one, usually spelled, usually written with a capital T and a capital O, the one, and uh, the many. And the one is best understood as being. 
with a capital B. In other words, pure being in a quasi-Parmenidean or Heideggerian sense. And the many is best understood as the plurality of objects. Sort of put in brackets, what about numbers, what about universals, what about uh, properties. Um, but essentially, or paradigmatically, in Neoplatonism, the, the many is a plurality of uh, physical objects. Now, in Neoplatonism, the many emanates from the one. Uh, there's a scholarly literature on what emanating um, is. It means at least that the existence of the one is, that is necessary for the existence of the many. It looks as though the existence of the one is sufficient for the existence of the uh, many. But it might further be true that in some way the many is an expression of the one. Now, uh, okay, so emanation is um, operating in one direction, but the many will return to the one. The destiny of the many is to return to the one. Now, we can raise the question of whether, I mean, as we did with Manichaeism, we can raise the question of whether Neoplatonism is compatible with Christianity or not. Well, it depends on your theology. It depends on how you interpret, Christ, how you interpret Christianity. But I'm inclined to say that prima facie, um, Neoplatonism is not logically inconsistent with Christianity. But from a Christian standpoint, Neoplatonism looks radically incomplete. It looks very abstract and austere and incomplete. Uh, notably, in Neoplatonism, uh, there's no uh, Christ, no incarnation, no resurrection, uh, probably no God as a person. The one as being seems rather an anonymous source of uh, the many. All these, uh, all these tenets, all these tenets which are distinctive of Christianity are missing from uh, are missing from Neoplatonism. Now, the third influence on Saint Augustine is the sack of Rome in 410. Now, Rome was sacked by Alaric the Goth, A L A R I C, Alaric the Goth in 410, and this understandably was widely understood as a catastrophe. It's not the first time that Rome has been uh, sacked. It was um, uh, sacked by the Gauls some centuries uh, earlier. And the sacking by um, Alaric was actually, uh, as sackings go, quite uh, moderate by the, standards of the, uh, by the standards of the time. Um, churches were not destroyed, clergy were not uh, slaughtered by and large, women and children were spared, uh, plundering was by and large confined to taking away items of uh, property. But nonetheless, this was perceived in the, in the classical world as, in a way, um, the, end of the, Roman, the end of the Roman Empire, 410 uh, AD, for example. Uh, the military bases in... Uh, the place called Britannia, which is now roughly England, Britannia is not Britain, uh, are, are evacuated uh, in 410, or in the period very shortly after 410. Um, the same for uh, Gallia and Hibernia and Caledonia. All these areas are uh, vacated by the Romans. Now, um, from 410 onwards, now, we can raise the question, uh, does the Roman Empire survive after 410? Now, this looks like a uh, historical question, but in a way, it's a, also a philosophical question because it depends on your definition of Roman Empire in single quotation marks. The Roman Empire 
in the period after 410, or arguably from 380, becomes the so-called Holy Roman Empire, the so-called Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is a fusion of the Roman Empire with Christianity. Now, the Holy Roman Empire, in one form or another, lasts until 1806. In, in August 1806, the Holy Roman Empire is officially abolished by Napoleon because Napoleon won the Battle of Austerlitz in uh, December 1805. Well, well, we needn't go into the historical uh, detail, but uh, for next week, <coughs> what the Holy Roman Empire is or might be will be important for understanding medieval theories of history. Now, the reason why the sack of Rome is an important um, influence on Augustine is that in the aftermath of the catastrophe, many people in the Mediterranean world blamed the rise of Christianity for the fall of Rome. They blamed the rise of Christianity for the fall of Rome. And as well as that, many people in the ancient world blamed the uh, decline in belief of the, Greek, of the Greek and Roman gods for the fall of Rome. So it's in a way regarded by in many circles as a punishment for the dropping of belief in the Hellenistic gods and the endorsement of uh, Christianity. Now Augustine, who by this time is well uh, converted to Christianity, Augustine conceives of his role to combat this position, this position and to say that really Christianity is not responsible for the fall of uh, Rome. Rome suffered m many catastrophes before, uh, before the coming of Christ, before the uh, life of Christ on earth, for example, sacking at the hands of the Gauls. So it would be irrational to say that it's the <coughs> rise of Christianity that's brought about the fall of the Roman Empire, this is the sacking of uh, Rome. Now, Augustine is the author of many interesting works, but I suppose at the moment the three most important or most widely read works by Augustine are the Confessions and the City of God and On the Trinity. Confessions, City of God and On the Trinity. Now, the city of God is a masterpiece of theology and an integration or reconciliation of Plato's philosophy with the Christian faith. Rather as um, St. Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s can be understood as reconciling Aristotle's philosophy with Christianity, we can understand St. Augustine as synthesizing into one theology the philosophy of Plato and um, Christianity. For example, and this can be argued philosophically and theologically, theologically one way or the other, but for example, it might be that the immortality of the soul, the immortality of the soul, is the, that idea is introduced into Christianity by Saint Augustine in the early 5th century AD. Depending on how we read the scriptures, depending on how we read 
the scriptures. It might be that orthodox Christianity includes no doctrine of the immortality of the soul, but instead has the hope of the resurrection of the whole human being. The resurrection of the whole human being. The hope of the resurrection of the psychophysical totality that you are. It could be that that's the biblical view of immortality. But St. Augustine introduces the idea of the immortality of the soul, which of course is Plato's view of immortality. It's Plato's view of immortality, which Plato in inherits from uh, Pythagoras, you know, triangles, uh, yeah. but, but, but in a way more interestingly, also immortality of the soul. Uh, and Pythagoras arguably uh, acquired this doctrine from various ancient Egyptian uh, mystical uh, uh, cults. Uh, now, we can put in brackets, um, all, that, all that might be, all that part might be wrong. Uh, maybe, depending on how we read, read the Bible, there is the immortality of the soul in a more or less uh, platonic uh, way. We could also put in brackets, the immortality of the soul in this platonic fashion might be an entailment of Christianity or it might be a logical presupposition of Christianity, even if not overtly endorsed in Scripture by an entailment or um, a logical presupposition of Christianity. I mean this. Unless the soul is immortal, Christianity can't be true. Unless the soul is immortal, Christianity can't be true. That's what I mean by pre presupposition. Um, un the word unless means if not. Or well, the word unless means if not uh, then. Or, some, or something like that. Okay, so that's, that's, contra that's uh, it's controversial. I mean, uh, Aquinas could be read, read as putting all this uh, right because he... he um, has an Aristotelian view of the uh, person, where the person is a psychophysical totality and the soul um, is not what your existence consists in as an independent substance. Now, this, so he's trying, Augustine is trying to reconcile Christianity with Neoplatonism. This is his first point about his project. I suppose the second project is that his work is ideological or almost uh, political. The city of God is written to prevent a resurgence of uh, paganism, and it's written as a justification of, uh, of Christianity or as a set of arguments for the truth of Christianity. Now... I'll, say, I'll talk about the city of God in, in just a moment, but I'll say something about history next. Um, St. Augustine has a linear view of history, whereas certainly Polybius, and arguably before Polybius, um, Herodotus and Thucydides, and arguably Livy, after Polybius, more or less, uh, all have a cyclical view of history. Now, we, we mustn't be too philosophically naive about the meanings of the words linear and cyclical, which look like spatial metaphors. But roughly speaking, on a, on a cyclical view of history, qualitatively similar events occur in numerical succession, or events of the same type are repeated 
over time. So civilizations rise, civilizations flourish, civilizations decay, civilizations uh, decline, or there are periods of peace and periods of uh, war, or periods of internal stability in the state, periods of rebellion, periods of revolution, periods of dictatorship or, or democracy. But what we have to notice on a uh, cyclical view is that it looks impossible for the, for the same event to be repeated. It looks impossible for the same event to be repeated. But by same event here is meant same one. Same, same one. It's possible for events of the same type to be repeated, but it's not possible for one event to be repeated. If we say, oh, that's completely uh, wrong, an event can be repeated, it's almost certain that we're thinking of an event that's later than that event and is not that event. So there's a very important distinction between same one and same time in understanding a cyclical view of history. Now, most uh, philosophers are clear on this point, and most historians are clear on this uh, point. Possibly Nietzsche is uh, confused on the point in his theory of eternal recurrence. Nietzsche thinks that um, you will live a number of qualitatively identical lives in the future, and the same events will be repeated an, an infinite number of times, in fact. Now, Augustine has got a linear view of history, or the essence of history is linear. In other words, there are events which are of immense historical significance that will not be repeated, according to Augustine. Now, I'll just mention these. They're the essential tenets of Christianity, I suppose. Number one, the creation. Number two, the fall. Number three, the incarnation. Number four, the passion and crucifixion. Number five, the resurrection. And number six, the last judgment. Now, these six events form a, f a framework or a grid within which human history occurs. And each one of them is of immense historical significance. Or if we ask, what is the meaning of history? Or why does anything happen at all? Or does history have a purpose or a destination? The answer for Augustine is in terms of this uh, framework. Now, the, the, the role of the creation is to bring about the natural, the natural world and human beings in the image of God. Now, the existence of the natural world and human beings in the existence of God is a necessary condition for history. Without that, there is no history. With that, there can be history. Secondly, the fall initiates uh, history as we understand it. Now, this is not so pronounced in Augustine, but if you have a look at... Um, um, If you have a look at um, if you have a look at um, well, there are so many of these church fathers actually. Um, uh, I wouldn't say for St. Augustine that history is essentially the history of sin, but uh, Saint Augustine, uh, for St. Augustine, history is essentially uh, a war against uh, sin. And obviously, you know, without the fall, without the historical episode of the fall, history would not have had this nature, or there would not have been uh, history as we know it. This, this idea is present in other church uh, fathers. 
Now, the incarnation is, in a sense, the most significant event within uh, history because the, inc the incarnation of the life of uh, Christ as both uh, Christ as both holy divine and holy human is the intersection between the permanent and the transitory or the intersection between the eternal and the historical. So the life of Christ, according to Augustine, is a guide or a clue to the meaning of history or Christ's appearance on earth is the link which enables us to decipher the meaning of history. Next, uh, the passion and the crucifixion. The crucifixion allows the possibility of uh, salvation or Christ dying for our sins shows the possibility of being uh, saved. Next, the resurrection teaches humanity the possibility of immortality or gives humanity the hope of immortality. And finally, the last judgment is the destination of history. Will history end? Yes. Will time end? Yes, time will end. What will happen at the end of time? The last uh, judgment. Now, there are certain uh, features of this framework within which Augustine understands history. Um, the first point is that past, present, and future are understood as a whole, as a totality by St. Augustine, uh, the totality of human existence in time. In other words, history isn't just uh, what has happened up to the present that takes in the whole of time. Secondly, history is the transient within the permanent. In a sense for Augustine, everything that happens, happens within God. Understanding this within or in is, is a difficult project for theology, but in some way, the transient is within or held within the permanent. So Augustine thinks we're all within the unchanging presence, the unchanging presence of uh, God, or the unchanging presence is the presence of God, and things come and go within the presence of God, the unchanging uh, now, the presence. And uh, thirdly, third point, is that God intervenes in uh, history. Now obviously the, the, uh, the incarnation is the most significant um, event under that uh, heading. But God intervenes in history, according to Augustine, in three other ways. Number one, miracles. Number two, by the um, actions of angels. And number three, by the actions of chosen human beings. Um, <coughs> Moses, Paul. Peter, I suppose, um, when the church is founded, Christ says to Peter, um, uh, you've heard from God. Yeah. Now, this, the book, the, the City of God, is about the conflict between two cities, what Augustine calls two cities. Number one, the earthly city, and number two, the city of God. And human history, in its most profound sense, is understood as the conflict between the earthly city and the city of God. Now, I say in its most profound sense, I, I mean, as historians, we can't understand it in a more profound way uh, than this. I mean, as history, as, as history. Now, Augustine thinks that everything, everything is subject to the conflict between the two cities. Anything that happens and anything anybody does and anything anybody thinks and anything uh, that happens to anybody, anything that happens is to be understood 
in terms of the conflict between the two cities. So I'll say something now about these two cities. Now, the, first of all, the earthly city. This can be understood in the following ways. It can be understood as the Roman Empire. Or secondly, it can be understood as the set of human beings. Thirdly, the earthly city is defined by material concerns, not spiritual concerns. Fourthly, the earthly city is defined by love, but love of self, not love of God. It's defined by love but love of self, not love of God. So, for any human being X in the earthly city, X loves X, and X does not love God. Or, to the extent to which any individual is a member of the earthly city, that individual privileges his or her own interests over service to God. Now, if we turn to the city of God, we can understand this as having the following features. Number one, we can understand it as the Catholic Church. Secondly, we could understand it as the Christian human beings. The Christian human beings. Thirdly, the city of God is defined by spiritual concerns, by a concern with salvation and living an ethical life and trying to live a religious life. Fourthly, the city of God is defined by love, but love of God, not love of self. So, a member of the city of God dedicates his or her life to the service of God, not to uh, serving their own interests. Now, historically, this uh, distinction between that Augustine draws between the earthly city and the city of God arises out of the predicament of Christianity within the Roman Empire. And this distinction between earthly city and city of God will assume massive importance in the high Middle Ages when it's not clear what the authority and power of the Holy Roman Emperor is and what the authority and power of the Pope is. So, in a way, Augustine, in the book, The City of God, provides the blueprint for the Middle Ages. Now, I'll just mention some very brief quotations from the City of God. These are from Book 11, Chapter 24, where Augustine goes into more detail about what the City of God is. Or he identifies certain properties of the City of God, which he thinks have been bestowed by uh, God. He, he says, uh, I mean, actually, there's no need to write these quotations down because um, they're on the, uh, where the black flies have <coughs> put the uh, handouts. They're on the handouts. Also, um, Kerry, my wife, is um, <coughs> putting some of this, beginning to put some of this material on the internet. Now, the, the first. Um, thing Augustine says is, he's talking about the city of God, if we inquire whence it is, that is where it came from, God created it. So the existence of the city of God 
entails uh, creation and entails a creator. Secondly, he, he implies that the, the city of God has wisdom. In other words, those who try to live a religious uh, life have a measure of wisdom. Where does that wisdom come from in the city of God? Augustine says, God illuminated it. God illuminated it. Uh, now, it follows that the city of God entails the existence of knowledge and the existence of consciousness. Thirdly, the city of God is blessed, and he says God is its bliss. So, being in the city of God causes bliss. Um, Augustine goes to some detail about why this uh, seems not to be the case. It looks as though being in the earthly city will bring you uh, happiness. And as a young man, you know, it should be behaved quite badly. Um, but, it, but true bliss is to be found in the uh, city of God. Then fourthly, he says the city of God has form by subsisting in him, by subsisting in God. So the city of God has form. This means um, there's something that it is, or it has a character or a nature or an essence. It has this form by subsisting in him, in God. So the city of God, the city of God is in a way within God or not far from God or in God. He says that the city, being in the city of God can bring enlightenment by contemplation. Now, he means contemplation of uh, God insofar as uh, that's possible in earthly finite form. The city of God entails uh, joy. The, the joy of being in the city of God comes from proximity to God. St. Augustine says of the city of God, it is, it sees, it loves. It is, in other words, the city of God has being. It sees, in other words, it sees the truth of the faith. And it loves, the city of God loves God. Next, according to Augustine, the life of the city of God is in God's eternity. The life of the city of God is in God's eternity. Now, by God's eternity, Augustine does not mean God lasting an, an awful long time or anything like that. Or Augustine doesn't mean God lasting for all time. Augustine means no temporal predicates apply to God, except God is present. God is present. In other words, God has to be understood as now. God has to be understood as now. Now, when I read Augustine, I take this as an identity statement. God is now. Uh, in other words, now is not when God is, or not just when God is, now is what God is, or now is part of what God is. So on this view, the unchanging now, or the fact that the time is always now, or it's never not now, is the unchanging now. And this unchanging now is the presence of God. This is the presence of God. The presence of God is nothing other than this imminence or the fact of it's always being now. So Augustine thinks that um, history unfolds in time, right, or takes time to unfold. But history unfolds in the unchanging now, in the absolutely still uh, now. And that's another sense in which um, oh no, uh, history is within God, or creation is within uh, God. Now, um, well, there's a lot actually that he says about the city of God. 
He says, uh, God's truth is its light. God's, God's truth is its light. Um, what he means by this, I think, by light is again um, presence. Light, um, shorn of metaphor in Augustine, is the now, the illumination of the present, the unchanging now in which everything uh, happens. And finally, Augustine says, uh, God's goodness is its joy. So the joy that one feels in following a spiritual path, um, if one does, is uh, by the grace of God. Now, the, the existence of these um, properties of the city of God, or this uh, situation in which we uh, find ourselves to the extent to which we succeed in being Christian, um, entails the Holy Trinity. It entails the Holy Trinity. And three of the properties of the city of God that I mentioned, amongst the, the many I just mentioned, three of them are being, presence, and consciousness. Being, presence, and consciousness. Now, Augustine thinks that um, history in general and the city of God and the earthly city, in fact, all of creation, presupposes the Holy Trinity. Without the Holy Trinity, uh, there'd be nothing. Well, there can't be nothing because uh, God necessarily exists. But there'd, no, there'd, be, no crea there'd be no creation. Now, uh, the way I read Augustine, um, being, presence, and consciousness are the uh, persons of the Trinity. Being is God the Father as I am. Presence is the presence of Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who exists from all eternity, but as Christ uh, is in our presence or uh, intervene in history. And consciousness on this understanding of St. Augustine is the Holy Spirit. And without these three, there can't be anything at all. Um, the three are intimately related, or the three are, in a way, three names of one and the same substance, or the one God. Now, I should put as an aside that um, if you read Augustine, if you read uh, De Trinitate, the third book that I mentioned on the, on the, on the Trinity, it's clear that Augustine thinks that the Trinity is apparent in two other ways as well. The, the Trinity is expressed in the whole of creation. And in the human mind, or more accurately, the human soul, soul and mind, the same thing for Augustine, uh, the human soul has a tripartite structure, which is a microcosm of the Trinity. Now, applying this distinction between the um, earthly city and the city of God to history, I'll just make some points about that. Number one is that a historical event is a struggle between the earthly city and the city of God. That's what a historical event is. Secondly, the two cities are entangled in history. The two cities are entangled. And we, human beings, might well make mistakes about what belongs to the city of God and what belongs to the earthly city. Mistakes in our knowledge, not just through temptation, but through ignorance. 
Thirdly, the movement of history from the past to the future, the movement of history from the past to the future is a pilgrimage from the earthly city to the city of God. Or to put it another way, the direction of history is a return to God. Now, depending on how you read Augustine, this, in a way, is, could be used to explain why history has a direction. History is the return to God. That's why there is a becoming past of the future in the present. In the absence of the need to return to God, uh, the implication is there would only be now, or the time would only ever be now. Now, the underlying or fundamental truth is that it's only ever now, but we're subject to becoming in the content of the now, or transience in what happens in the now. Uh, fourth point is that the struggle between the two cities, according to Augustine, will last as long as there is uh, time. I suppose you know Augustine allows it. Could be, the struggle could be ended by the grace of God, but he thinks that doesn't seem to be the, the plan as, as we're acquainted with it. Uh, fifth point is that nothing is neutral. Every thought, every action, every event either assists the earthly city or assists the, uh, the city of God. Sixth point, uh, the, the, the progress and fate of the Catholic Church is uh, the progress of the city of God. What happens to the church is the fate of the uh, city of God. Now, I'll just mention something about St. Paul to do with um, Colossians chapter 1. If you have a look at Colossians chapter 1, especially 15 to 20, there are Christian tenets which bear quite closely on um, philosophy of history. Um, I'll skip the first few because we need to stop. But I'll just say, um, in him were all things created in heaven and on earth. This is the uh, creation as a necessary condition for uh, history. Uh, both visible and invisible were created. Now, St. Paul says, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and in him. In other words, the earthly city, in a way, is part of um, God's creation. God has created the thrones, the dominations, the principalities, the powers. In other words, the material of history has been created by God. Uh, when I say God here, St. Paul is talking about uh, Christ, or he's talking about the second person of the Trinity. But of course, the second person of the Trinity exists from all eternity, not just uh, just by Christ on earth. Now, well, if, if you're especially interested, you can go and read the rest of Col Colossians uh, uh, 1. Right, enough, I think, for your early discussion. <clears throat>